Our text this evening is found in the passage that was read to us a few moments ago, the 17th chapter of the book of Exodus. And it's there in the 15th verse. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisai. For he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Jehovah Nisai. The Lord uh, is my banner. Uh, John Gill, very interestingly, says it could also be interpreted, the Lord is my miracle. Uh, I won't go down that line, but it's an interesting thought. And of course, these uh, verses, these chapters are full of miracles. And uh, the Lord does do miraculous and wonderful things. If ever uh, a painting was to be made of this subject, of this chapter here, it would be a magnificent scene, a dramatic scene of Moses there on Sinai, Horeb, we know Sinai is really, uh, has two peaks, Horeb and Sinai, and yet all one mountain. But if a painting was to be made of this scene, uh, it would be quite dramatic and quite marvellous to see the armies under Joshua fighting down there on the plain and the venerable Moses with his arms stretched wide being upheld uh, there pouring out his heart in solemn and urgent prayer to the Lord for a victory. And so that's how it was. Amalek, the enemies of the people of God. We know about Amalek. Uh, some say, of course, he was the, uh, related uh, to um, the people of Israel uh, and uh, was, a, was a, a, a blood relative. Uh, others say uh, uh, that he wasn't uh, related, that it was an earlier tribe uh, altogether. Well, I don't know exactly the answer to that either, but he was certainly uh, an enemy. Of, the tribe was certainly an enemy of the people of Israel. And if he was closely related to them by Esau, then this was an unexpected attack. Uh, you don't expect to be attacked by those that are nearest and dearest to you, close to you. And that does happen sometimes uh, in our experience of life, and we must always be on our guard. This whole, the whole atmosphere, really, of this event uh, bears some reflection on us as we start. As we go through these chapters just preceding this one, you have the wonderful miracle of the, uh, the opening of the Red Sea, the great deliverance of the people of Israel, of course, from slavery and bondage in Egypt. And there you, we see the sea opened. Well, obviously, it speaks to us of the power of God to open the sea and so on. But just think of it for a second of your experience or mine if we were actually passing through that open sea, that miraculously open sea. And if it was, or sometimes it's pictured, I don't know, uh, with the waters uh, standing up either side of us, however it was, in some ways it must have been a frightening experience, something we certainly weren't used to having such an experience. But it speaks to us not only of the mighty power of God, but of the Christian experience as we make our way through this world. We see time and again Red Seas opening up before us. We see dramatic events. We see courage rising within us to deal with and go through such experiences. We see in so many ways the Lord providing for us. And then they come to Mara, the bitter waters of Mara. And again, that reminds us of the experiences of the Christian life. We, all of us from time to time come through bitter periods as part of our preparation for heaven. Always remember this that our experiences in this world, sometimes people say, why does God allow us to go through these times of suffering? Well, in one way or another, they are preparations for heaven. Have you ever thought of the first sermon you can remember? 
Can you go back in your mind to the sermons you may have heard when you were a child maybe, or growing up, or when you were first converted? And uh, if you were brought up in the things of God, you, you can go back a long way. And I thought of that. And I thought, I once heard a man say, an old man, he was a visiting local preacher, an itinerant. He actually worked for the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board. Well, that's irrelevant to this, what I'm saying now. But I remember him saying, I walked the other day, I was only a boy, he said, I walked the other day past um, a, a, a furniture maker's shop and uh, there was a notice outside, he said, and it said this, it's very simple, he said, uh, workshop downstairs, showroom upstairs. And I thought, well, it's a very homely thing, but this is what's happening to us, isn't it? We come to these bitter experiences in life and we say, why is this, what is this all about? But it's all part of bringing us to the glories of heaven beyond this scene. And we've also experienced the manna falling from heaven, have we not? The very bread of heaven. Whenever we open this great book before us now, we're feeding, feasting on the bread of heaven, are we not? These experiences, yes, they're here, they're part of the history of the people of Israel, but we know these things every day. Uh, and we know the disappointments of coming to Rephidim. Uh, the, the Rephidim really is about a place of plenty and so on, but it didn't turn out to be that. And we expect things to come along our way and be blessings, and then sometimes they're not, and we get very disappointed. Uh, that can happen to us in life. And yet, water, we experience water coming out of the rock in Horeb and so on. Uh, and the same here with these enemies that come to us in the form of Amalek. So all this is ever so relevant to what we're doing now. Well, the picture is Moses with his arms stretched wide and uh, Aaron and her holding up his hands. We know the scene very, very well. And of course, the rod of Moses is in his hands. Hands, it tells, tells you that there. And these two scenes, or this scene with its two, two aspects, Moses on the mount in prayer, and the younger ones down there on the plain fighting with Amalek. It's, um, it's a scene, again, that's uh, in some ways familiar to us, or it should be an example to us. Picture it like this, simply for a start. The old man Moses, the aged man, the venerable saint, he's there pouring out his heart in prayer and supplication. And the young men, they're there fighting the enemy down on the plain. And there, in the midst of it all, is the rod, the famous rod that smote the Red Sea and so on. And uh, there is prayer, and there is action, and then there is the rod. And we sometimes say, uh, here is the rod, here is the rod that opens Red Seas, you know. Uh, here is the rod that defeats our enemies, and so you could go on. And should it not always be? that the part and purpose of the church is to pray, obviously. We've been reminded of that already. And is it not part of the duty of the church to fight? And is it not part of our great privilege to be setting forth and showing forth and holding up the very word uh, of God? Don't forget the old rod of prayer. Don't forget the old rod of the setting forth of the word, preaching the word. And don't forget, we've called to fight the good fight uh, of faith. And uh, it's a picture for what a church should be doing as well. And if we neglect prayer, we're in serious trouble. And if we uh, lose our confidence in the word, well, we're going to be defeated every time. Uh, and if we don't fight, well, we're, we're in another difficult situation, uh, are we not? Now, Moses is on the mount then, and uh, the matter here 
comes up of uh, morale, morale. You can imagine the folk down there in the valley fighting, looking up whenever the opportunity came and seeing Moses there with the rod held out uh, and so on. They weren't a seasoned army. This is the first fight uh, of the journey, the wilderness journey. They're going to experience plenty of opposition and different fights, but this, this is the first one. Uh, we know from the 13th chapter of Exodus uh, that um, they didn't, uh, God took them on the roundabout routes, didn't he? You know, if you look at your maps of the, the route, the journey of the, the Israelites through the wilderness, you think, dear me, I, I wouldn't have gone that way. I wouldn't have gone all around there. Uh, and yet uh, it, it tells you there, there in chapter 13, verse 17, it says, For God said, Lest peradventure the people repent when they see war. They didn't want to go into trouble straight away, or they weren't seasoned for it, they weren't ready for it. But they are by now. Uh, and there's the wisdom of God, holds off this battle till this point, so they've seen some more of these provisions of God and grown a little bit in their experience. But morale again, Moses there uh, on the mountainside, pleading. There's a spiritual battle going on here. And perhaps one thing they remembered when they looked and saw Moses with his arms spread wide. This was no ordinary battle. This was the Lord's battle. This was a, a spiritual battle. This was, uh, the, the spiritual forces were at play here in what they were experiencing. And I think we sometimes forget that in our lives, our battles, our work. We're in a spiritual situation. The man, as you know, who gave us the very helpful chapter divisions in the Bible, sometimes we say they're not always in the right place, but they're very, very helpful. Uh, Stephen Langton, who also gave us the Magna Carta, um, he, he said this, or was said of him this, he said that uh, he lived in the, the recognition, the realisation, we could say, that the visible is controlled by the invisible. The visible is controlled by the invisible. He lived like that. He said, uh, the tangible by the spiritual. And he said that there was a, a law governing all things, being evidenced, working its purposes out in all things, and that that law was the very breath of God moving uh, in all the events of time and so on. Well, he achieved a great deal, that man, because he lived in the realm of the spiritual. And uh, that's certainly uh, to be seen here in this passage. And, of course, we have the great chapter, Ephesians 6. I read a bit of it, but we know it off by heart, do we not? Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle, this is it, this for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We forget that, uh, but uh, we, don't do, we don't do well uh, if we forget it. And there are people um, who don't think like that, and uh, they, they don't achieve very much in this realm. Now, Remember, these people had, not very long before these events, been in terrible bondage all those years, slaves in Egypt. So they're not long since out of that situation, are they? And you could forgive them if they thought to themselves, well, we've come out of that, we've been delivered from that, we've brought out by the hand of God from all those troubles. 
And we've even come through the Red Sea as on dry land. God has proved that he is with us by all his provisions on the way. And as I say, you could forgive them for thinking, well, now our troubles are over. We've gone through all that. And now all we've got to do is get to the promised land. Well, we sometimes think like that, don't we? We've, we've gone through one sea of troubles or we've been converted and we're in the good of the gospel and we know something of the joy of the Lord and the joy of sins forgiven and we've, 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 we've come now to that happy place and then, then the warfare begins. <laughs> well, that is true, isn't it? But it was true for them and it's, uh, it's true for us. We're in a fight. Um, Paul, again, quoting the Apostle Paul, he, he, he knew all about this, and uh, you, you find it in the, in the Epistle to the Romans, as, as we know that well-known passage. It's in the seventh chapter. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Uh, and so on. He knew that there was a battle on. Going in his innermost soul, he was fighting, uh, even within himself. Never mind the enemies uh, that were outside him. Uh, there, is, there is a warfare in this world. And part of this warfare and part of this trouble, you know, is, as we hinted at the beginning, is for our lasting good. Sometimes... We pray, and so we should pray, perhaps in the words of the hymn, all oh, for a closer walk with God. We pray that. We want that. We should pray that. A heart from sin set free, a heart that only feels the blood so freely shed for me. We want that. That's our prayer. That's our aspiration. But then there's another hymn I could quote here. You will know it, no doubt. It says this. It's by Newton. I ask the Lord that I may grow in faith and love and every grace. Might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. We all recognize that prayer. It's a good prayer. And then you know the next verse. "'Twas he who taught me thus to pray, and he I trust has answered prayer. But it has been in such a way as almost drove me to despair. I can see that you know it well, and you've experienced it. Uh, well, these people, they, they were going through these trials and troubles, of course, and it no doubt was almost driving them to despair. But the Lord was in it all. We've already said that the attack by Amalek was unexpected. If it was that Amalek was a close relation through Esau, uh, then it was even more uh, unexpected. Some people say it was probably launched again against the, the rear of the uh, group, the procession, as it were. I don't know, it doesn't say that here, but some people say that. But it was unexpected, uh, certainly, I suppose, when you remember that Pharaoh's army had been destroyed at the Red Sea. So, so they, they weren't expecting it. But we do have to be on our guard, don't we, in our Christian warfare against the unexpected. We said already, I say it again, Rephidim, where they were just at the beginning of this chapter, it meant rest. Rest. You can imagine them thinking this, can't you? We'll soon be in Rephidim. You know, we'll soon, we'll soon we'll come to a, a period of rest. But they didn't. They didn't. And uh, Masar and Meribah uh, really means a place of temptation or strife. So they were expecting rest. But they got temptation not to trust the Lord, murmur against God, and so on. There was no water in that place. And then that connection, putting that there and thinking about that at this time, you could say this, 
moving on slightly, you could say, well, didn't they deserve this attack uh, from Amalek? After all, you, you know, they, they, they've been murmuring against God. They, they've been complaining. Complaining about Moses and, and all the other things. Uh, maybe they brought this upon themselves. Maybe they did. And then we say, well, every time we have trouble, does it mean we brought it upon ourselves? And then you have to say, no. <laughs> sometimes it is, isn't it? We can sometimes work it out quite easily, although we have to be careful. We don't overdo it. But then on other times we suffer and we haven't deserved it at all. In fact, we may have been very zealous for the Lord our God. We may be those who are very active in his work. We may be those who are very prayerful and so on. And yet we get attacked. We don't deserve it. But we have to weigh up these things, don't we? Sometimes we deserve it. Sometimes it's because we are being very faithful Christians and the devil wants to stop us. Well, all these things are, are brought to our minds uh, as, we, as we look at these, uh, these events here. Well, we ought to come a bit closer then to our text, verse 15, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. We've been talking about Moses' rod. It's Moses' rod that was being held up here. And then we might say to ourselves, well, where is this banner? We can see a rod in Moses' hand, but where's the banner? But of course, the rod is the banner. And uh, if you look this up, you'll discover that in those ancient days, a banner was really very often just a, a rod with maybe some glinting brass or shiny metal on the top that would catch the glint uh, of the sun. You know that in warfare, ancient warfare anyway, the banner went before the army, before the troops. Uh, they, they had their banners and standards so that the men could see and recognize who were their men, their army, to distinguish from the other, their opponents, and so on. And so at first, it wasn't a, a banner in the way we think of it, a pole with, uh, with some uh, uh, cloth attached to it or something with some design on it. No, it was simply a, a rod with a shining metal top, as it were, on the top so that the, the sun would catch it and glint and, and you could see it and so on. So the rod is the banner. That's the first thing we may say there. And it was the rod of God. But then we remember this. Banners not only identify whose side we're on, they don't just tell us which way our army is to go, the way of the charge or whatever the way to do and so on. Uh, but very often in later times, of course, banners were an inspiration to the, the troops that were following them. You know, if you go into these old churches or cathedrals, you see the banners of past, past fights and so on. You know, they may have inscriptions on like Sebastopol or uh, uh, Alma or uh, Pretoria or Rockstrift or something like that on. And uh, it stirs the soul of every true soldier, of every true patriot. And we remember these great victories. Well, that's part of the idea uh, of a banner to, to stir the soul. And we mentioned earlier about morale. Morale, very, very important. Uh, in a battle to keep our spirits up, to keep our morale up. I think it's right to say that uh, Napoleon, said of Napoleon, I was just trying to see the right figure here because I'm bad on figures, but I think it was a, uh, 140, no, no, I've got the wrong number, I think. Well, anyway, I'll just say it was the equivalent to hundreds of extra troops coming onto the field just to see Napoleon there uh, at the head of the army. 
If he came on the scene, it rallied the troops immediately to an enormous extent. In fact, Napoleon himself said this, that victories were won by two thirds, were two thirds won by the morale of the troops and one third by the strategy of the generals. So morale was more powerful. So he was the general saying it, so you have to believe it. Uh, more effective than uh, having a good general or strategist. So this rod of Moses lifted the morale, as did the prayers and the whole sight of these things. We need to keep our morale up in the Christian fight. We need to keep our morale up in the churches because we live in, in evil days. I needn't remind you of that. And many churches are in difficulties and we have to pray for them because uh, they are times uh, of great anxiety for the, for the churches. But we mustn't lose sight of the fact that God is at work. You've probably heard this, but it's been said lately about the way the, the Bible is getting into the, um, the, the Middle East or, or, or the, uh, the Muslim, strong Muslim countries uh, of the Middle East. And there are two things behind it. One is the, uh, the wide provision of mobile phones. You may think they're a nuisance. Well, they can be. But you, you see these people through their mobile phones, which are easily accessible, can just flick a switch and there is the Bible. The Bible would be a forbidden book, but they, they, they can read it just in the privacy of their own rooms or wherever they are. It's, it's a remarkable thing. And somebody else has said, uh, another factor in this is, is Al-Qaeda and, and those movements. When, when these Muslims see what people like that do, it makes them think, you know, is this, is this, uh, is this faith that I profess and have been brought up to? Is this real? And with these sort of things, God moves. And we say God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. But there is much to encourage us, though there is much to discourage us in the scene in our own country at this time. But um, morale is a very important thing. And I think all preachers have a responsibility of keeping the morale up and, and encouraging and so on. So... We are fighting against the spirit of the age and we need to pray for preachers and teachers and all of us in these, in these times to pray and not to faint. But then, of course, we need to say something about prayer because that's an integral part of what's being described here. When Moses stood with arms spread wide, you know, it, success was found on Israel's side. But when his uh, arms failed, of course, that moment Amalek prevailed. And prayer is a very important thing. The Apostle Paul, again, encourages us to pray and not to faint. It's very easy to faint, and there's much to uh, cause us to faint, but to pray against that sort of spirit. I, I reminisce again. One time I had to visit a, an old lady with, uh, she belonged to the Salvation Army. And she had what looked like a text on the wall, but it wasn't a text. It could have been a text. I, I be careful what I say. But she had this written on the wall. Trust in the Lord and fight. Trust in the Lord and fight. Well, I thought that's pretty good. And I've always remembered it. Uh, well, we do. You may say this. We sometimes pray for our world leaders. They need our prayers in so many ways, do they not? And um, the president of the United States, whatever we may think of him, uh, he needs a great deal of prayer uh, at this particular time. But uh, he might do well to remember these words of his illustrious predecessor, Abraham Lincoln. Abram Lincoln, he said this, he said, um, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. 
I have very often been driven to my knees by the overwhelming conviction I had nowhere else to go. You may say that was a bit faithless in some ways, but we know what he meant. We've nowhere else to go, but it's a great place to go to and it, it brings great results. Now, that would take us to think about some of the times when our own country has been in straits. Well, it's in straits now, but we know, we all know this, though some of us weren't alive then, that when the Second World War, no doubt the First World War was underway, the nation prayed. How much of it was genuine or just fear? I don't know. But it cannot be argued against that the nation prayed. The First World War, we had the biggest navy, biggest fleet, I think I'm right to say, than had ever been at sea. It was certainly the biggest fleet there in the world at the time of the First World War. And the commander of the fleet was Admiral Beatty. And Beatty said this, he said, we will never win this war unless our people pray. We will never win this war unless our people pray. Could have boasted about our uh, overwhelming superiority of sea power and so on, but he didn't. And he knew that. And I just reflect on that for a minute, that those days we wouldn't say they were great days for the gospel. 1914, 18, it wasn't in the best of states even then. But we did have people prominent in prominent positions that were not afraid to say things like that. And that does reflect on that. I'll mention one or two other people like that in a minute. Prayer then. But there is prayer and action, of course, in this, uh, this whole situation. People sometimes accuse the Christian church or even Christians of being fatalists, almost saying, well, you know, God's in charge and there's nothing else that we can do. That's not a proper definition of fatalism, but it can be a kind of Christian version of it that we simply say, all we have to do is pray, nothing else. As long as we pray, that's it. We can't do anything better. Well, we can't in one respect. But the Bible doesn't say that. And, and this is a marvelous example of it. Prayer and action. Also, we could say here that we live in times when um, there is a sense in which man feels that he's self-sufficient and he can cope with anything. That's a characteristic of today, isn't it? People today, they don't even think about praying. That's something that our forefathers did years ago where they didn't really understand the world. And diseases came, pandemics came, and they thought they just had to pray and it would all be resolved. Ah, oh, but we're far more clever now. We can invent vaccines that I'm not decrying them in any shape or form. It's very good. We're thankful for them. But you know how it is. Sanitation, sorry to mention the subject, but it sort of uh, destroyed thousands of students of cholera. Well, all we have to do is pray about it and it'll be all right. No, it wasn't until some brave souls, and I, I dare say this, I know this is a fact, it was many local clergymen, if I can use that word, pastors, vicars, and so on, who in, in many of our large towns and cities, grasped hold of the idea uh, that what, we, what the problem was was better sanitation. Uh, and some of them spent a long time doing that. Maybe they should, but you know what I mean. Prayer and action go together. I've often used the example of the, uh, the great uh, Calvin monument in Geneva. People sometimes say of Calvinism, that it's fatalism. You know, God's in control of everything and uh, nothing happens without his say so. He is the sovereign God. And man can do nothing at all. Well, the answer to that, of course, 
one answer is that Calvin monument uh, in Geneva. And you say to yourself, uh, who, who are part of that monument? Well, the great Calvin himself is the foremost figure, but then you, you have uh, Coligny of uh, uh, France and uh, William the Silent of, of the Netherlands, uh, and you have an example of the, the uh, Pilgrim Fathers and so on. And you can say to yourself, with these men who did nothing, <laughs> simply poured out their hearts in pious prayers and nothing more. No, you say, these were men of action, vitality, vision, energy. The world has hardly seen the likes of since. Oh, they were men of prayer, mighty in it. But they were also men of action. You can come closer to home. In this recent pandemic, people have remembered the plague at Aem uh, all those centuries ago, 1665. Oh, well, oh, they crowded into the church and prayed. Yes, they did. But they also isolated themselves and organized themselves so that the, the, the plague wouldn't spread. The two things go together. I'll stay on this theme just for a few more minutes. There are many examples you can come across in history. Now, the famous Battle of Bannockburn. Englishmen don't talk about it because we lost. But one of the features of that battle was that Robert the Bruce, the great leader of the Scots at that time, before the battle commence those tense moments when the two sides stand facing one another, when, when the men there gathered ponder on whether this would be the last day of their life, that tense, silent moment. And what did Robert the Bruce command his men to do? To kneel in silent prayer before the battle commenced. Well. I don't say they just, they won simply because they prayed, but great things are achieved by prayer. And if we do things prayerfully, we're doing things in the right way. Go, go to Cromwell himself later on, of course, and his model army. It's, he says, he says it uh, in, in his letters and so on. You read it in the letters and speeches. Uh, he, he talks about the, the model army never, never prospered until he began to see that the recruits, the policy of recruiting men, he must look out for men, as he put it, that made a conscience of all they did spiritually minded men, prayerfully minded men who made a conscience of all that they did. I don't want to go on too long with these illustrations, but I might as well tell you now. But Montgomery in the Second World War, some say he was conceited, some say he was thought too much of himself, but that may be unjust. But he was certainly a man uh, of prayer and he was certainly a man of God. And um, before any task there in North Africa, uh, he, he would spend time uh, in, in prayer. And, and before all those great battles took place, of course, there was prayer. I'm looking for a little booklet that I had with me. I had it here somewhere. I had it. No, it isn't. Well, the, the, the man from um, High, High Wickham there, he, uh, I, could, I, I could lose my head if it was, here it is. <laughs> he, he's written a, um, a, a very good book. I don't know if you've seen it, When a Nation Prays. And he's done a very unique thing. We, we've all um, heard of national days of prayer in the war. We know about it. But what this man has done, he hasn't just reminded us of those. He seems as if he has gone through, well, he must have gone through hundreds of local newspapers and brought to light just in this city or that city or that town or that village, people uh, organizing their own times of prayer, to pray 
for the for the nation and so on. And um, he gets them out of all sorts of papers that are not so well known. I, I opened it at this page, the Nottingham Evening Post. Does that paper still exist? I don't know whether it does or not. But anyway, it, it was reported in the Nottingham Evening Post uh, that the church, St. Mary's Church in the city, uh, was filled to absolute capacity at one particular time of prayer. And not only was that church packed to capacity, uh, but also the nearby church of St. Peter's was full, so full nobody else could get in. And the mayor of Nottingham uh, spoke uh, and uh, spoke about the, the providence of God and the need to turn to God uh, at times of great crisis. That's just one example of the hundreds that he, he relates. And it just rebukes us, doesn't it, to our, at our own day. But the importance of prayer, talking about the war, this is a slight aside, but I, I mention it, that um, there was a man, there must have been quite a few people at the time of the war, that were dealing with refugees fleeing before the face of the oncoming Nazis and so on. And um, many of these people, I, I've got this record here, the, some Russians and Polish and Belgians and so on, were flooding into the country for safety. And this man had to interview them. And he discovered that many of them were communists. They weren't all from communist designated countries, but they'd imbibed the spirit of uh, communism. And he soon found, that because he was a Christian and he was trying to find out where they were coming from and what he could say to them, but he discovered that they, uh, they all of them had a pessimistic understanding or view of what Christianity was. Uh, they all thought Christianity was a hindrance to progress, was detrimental to the well-being of mankind and so on, and to be got rid of as soon as possible. This seemed to be the, the attitude. This is what they'd picked up on the way. Now, uh, I, I mention that because it's prevalent today, uh, and uh, you, know, you wonder where it's come from, but there's one source. But that's been a, an opinion held by many. But when you come to passages of Scripture like this, and many, many other, other examples, you realize it is not. It is that which alone puts into the soul, spirit, and mind of mankind, not only that which is good, not only reconciling us to God, but aims and outlooks and purposes and strength to deal with the evils and troubles and difficulties both within us and around us. And when man starts to think he can do without God, then he's in very, very serious trouble uh, indeed. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. In, in the prophecy of Isaiah, you, you have the, the, the king of Assyria, and he, he looks out at his great conquests, and he says this, by the strength of mine hand, I have done this. Well, it is the Lord God who puts down the mighty from their seat and exalts the humble and meek, as Mary said, in the Magnificat. And you have Nebuchadnezzar in the fourth of Daniel. He surveys from his balcony, you imagine, uh, the magnificent city of Babylon. Oh, Babylon, which I have built, which I have built. And then the next thing he is sunk into the, the, the likeness of an animal, really. He's debased himself in every way. And that's what man does when it forgets God, prayer, fight for him. Well, we see the evidence of that roundabout. Well, uh, we must hurry on. The rod, or the banner, reminds us who we are fighting for. Jehovah, Nisai. And um, 
it does us good, doesn't it, to remember whose side we're on. We say the Lord is on my side. And that makes all the difference in life, doesn't it? Whatever you're going through, the Lord is on my side. So to know who we're fighting for, we can't, we can't but win. We cannot but win. Nil desperandum while God reigns. This is the God who made the heavens and the earth, sustains all things. All things are under his sway and command. Calvin's motto, or one of his mottos, God will win. This is who we're fighting for. And then we should remind ourselves that we are fighting. We forget that. I know I've probably already said it. But uh, we have so many hymns again, do we not, <laughs> that remind us we should be fighting. Uh, if you're walking home tonight, if you're driving, maybe keep your eyes on the road. But you could think of all the all the hymns that ex remind us and exalt us to, to fight. I go back to my Sunday school days. Hold the gospel banner high, unto victory grand, Satan and his hosts defy, and shout for Daniel's band. Well, it's simple, but it's true, isn't it? And so we could go on down that line. Now, let's not forget Aaron and her holding up Moses' hands. Well, the fellowship of the saints is something that's vital. We believe in the communion of the saints and the life everlasting, quoting the prayer book. But it's important, if we're in an army, that we pull together. You may say a church without love in it. It's no church at all. So many churches are at each other's throats, or people in each church is at each other's throats, and that's a very bad thing. But we're supposed to hold each other's hands up in prayer, are we not? We're supposed to be encouragers, not discouragers. Where things are right, that is, of course. And the, the role of Aaron and her is vital. And to uphold the hands of a minister, leader, somebody in charge of the church or whatever, somebody who's uh, going out evangelizing or someone who's sick and weary and so on, to hold one another up is a very, very important part of church life. Well, you say anybody could have held up Moses' hands. Well, what about the widow with her two mites? They wouldn't make much difference, would they? Two mites. But we remember them to, to this day, do they not? Uh, and small things can be great contributions, really, though not thought of by many. What about the Good Samaritan? Just one fellow lying by the road. Ah, oh, yes, but so much in all these things. So Aaron and her help us to help each other on to each receive the starry crown. That's a good principle to have. And then, of course, the whole thing is typical. As Aaron and her held up Moses' hands, so our Lord Jesus Christ before the throne of God prays, prays and intercedes for us. He upholds our hands. He keeps us in the way. Uh, we can't ever overestimate the power of Christ's petitions uh, before the throne of God. You say to yourself, why does God, the Son, the everlasting Son of God, the eternal Son of God, why does he need to pray to the Father? Why doesn't the Father just see to it himself, you may say, or know about it himself? Well, we say this, that in one sense our Lord's work isn't done. Oh, don't get me wrong. His work on the cross, his great work of atonement is done and forever done. But the completion of God's purposes through Christ isn't foolish yet. It won't be till the end of time, the end of the world, when the new heaven and the new earth comes in and so on. And so Christ is still the mediator until that comes and the climax and fulfillment and glorious completion of all the works of God. So at this time, he still ever lives to make intercession for us. But it's got that picture. 
and Christ the victor, he stands there before the throne of God as the victor. All his saving work in that sense is, is done and he has uh, won the victory. He has uh, burst the gates of hell as it were. He has risen from the tomb and so he stands. But there is one final thing we ought to say and that is this we were talking earlier about uh, where else in the bible do we talk about the banner and of course it's in the second chapter of the song of solomon his banner over me is love he brought me into this banqueting house and his banner over me is love well how would you describe the banner of his love well in one way you could describe it as the cross itself the, the, not the image of it but the idea of it as it were the truth of it the reality of it there uh, is manifested in, in an absolutely unique way god's love for his people and whenever we get down and troubled and feel guilty or even not even in the good of the gospel there is that banner of love uh, which is the cross and it says he brought me into his banqueting house. Well, we are in the banqueting house now. Um, he, he feeds us, he nourishes us on spiritual things. He helps us, he feeds us with the bread of heaven, to use that. We drink of the water of life. Uh, all that is part of being in the banqueting house. And we say well, again with the hymn right, I wouldn't change my blessed estate for all the world calls good or great. We're in the banqueting house. And yet it still lies before us in another sense, doesn't it? And I have not seen and neither have it entered into the heart of man those good things that God has prepared for them that love him. That's you, Christian, and I. That's our final destiny, when we we'll then, at that time, begin to appreciate what those words mean. He brought me into his banqueting house, and his banner over me is love. So we may think on these things, and I'll draw to a close now, and we'll sing our final hymn, which is the hymn 870 who is on the Lord's side, who will serve the King, who will be his helpers of the lives to bring. 870.